I'd like to introduce uh, Adam Arkin. Adam is head of the Physical Biosciences Division at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is scattered all over the city of Berkeley. Um, and he's going to talk uh, not about his, his own primary work, but rather about DOE's uh, systems biology knowledge base. Adam? Okay, so uh, systems biology knowledge base. This is one of those things which people often have a hard time wrapping their head around, and I think we're still learning how to do it ourselves. But, um, you know, before I launch into what it is now, I want to talk a little bit about where it came from, um, in my mind anyway. You know, around 2001, 2002, um, Rick Stevens and I were thinking about what was going to happen next in biology, and we were working on, I was working on dynamical models of cells, and Rick was working on uh, informatics in ways that I wasn't used to at the time, and we really didn't have any sense of what that meant, you know, how it was going to come together in any reasonable way. But we decided that we were going to be very bold, and we proposed to DOE in a white paper that we would build the National Library of Microbial Ecology and Physiology, and I would add to that engineering at this point. And the idea was that NIH wasn't serving what we thought was going to be the big thing, and that DOE, as a steward of large science, would be the agency which would know how to turn big data into big models. And if you think of what a knowledge base is, it's about that, and I'll try to argue that in a few minutes. So, so K-Base, um, when, it, when, it, when it began to be discussed seriously by DOE, sort of fit into that picture of where you know, Rick and I wanted to go, and so we were excited to see when the workshop started that people um, you know, were you know, suspicious, <laughs> but excited that maybe there was something there to do. And uh, Bob Cottingham, who's our chief operations officer, spent a lot of time organizing workshops to make sure that everyone had a sense of what it was. And if you go to the website, if you type into Google, uh, K, you know, knowledge base, it's a biology knowledge base, and you go to the community document, it is, of course, all things to all people immediately. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, reduce the scope infinitesimally. <laughs> So first of all, why do we need this thing? Well, I, you know, really it's because uh, DOE's mission is extremely complicated. And, it is, and since DOE is an agency that has the wherewithal to coordinate large groups of people towards common goals, you can imagine that though the missions are complex, you have an opportunity to use that organized human force to create data sets and models that are supported by the right set of information. Whereas if you're all individual point people, then it would, the, the, the entropy in the data itself might be very hard to work with. So we have an opportunity to do this. So we, we want, DOE mission, if I summarize it in my own words, is the ability to predict, control, and design the biological components of energetic processes, in, for, in the BER anyway. So the idea is, is that you understand something when you can predict what it will do, when you can control its state, and when you can design in that medium. That's when you understand the system. So, uh, the problem is, is that the systems you want to understand are, are geological, almost. They're how, how biology transforms the environment. It's how the sun drives plants to you know, make things that microbes use that we can then turn into fuels. And this is a very complicated internet, interconnected network of things. So as scientists, if you look at just the sheer flow of data that we're generating, partly from DOE and partly elsewhere, it's just too much for us to handle, at least for me anyway. And so I thought that you know, what we want to build in a, in, a, in, a, in a software tool is something that allows you to filter information rapidly, to focus your attention on the things that matter to you personally, um, and ask the right questions and leverage other minds. Because I think it's hard for one person to hold all this information in their mind, trying to understand geochemistry and plant biology and, the, and your particular microbe in your head is hard. So we want something that enables you to get to that information quickly. We also are able to leverage something that, that, that DOE has done very well, which is really, really to focus attention on with, with projects that support these data. That's sort of what I was telling you before. They have the bioenergy research centers. They have terrestrial ecosystems, SFAs. They have uh, big investments in, in, um, in metabolic modeling and in plant feedstocks. And so we have the ability to populate these knowledge bases in the databases with things that have some meaning to the researchers. We're at, in an organized sort of you know, way. So knowledge base is an opportunity to integrate that data and other data and the tools they develop into a common framework. So this is what I was saying, you know, this has been, the, the, the idea for, for K-Base as a formal entity within BER has been around since pre-2010 and there's been a number of, 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 of workshops on it. Um, but when we got the award, we threw out the document and threw it again. <laughs> 
we listened to it, but it wasn't the actual thing they wanted to do. So now, the idea, of course, is that we have this idea, we have a few, you know, a few principles. One is that there's going to be lots and lots of data generators, and they're going to have their own systems, and their own desires, and their own ways of doing things, but we want to be able to serve them and enable them to do their work nonetheless. And JGI is one of those people. Um, there's going to be software and tool developers. We can't do everything, and people are going to be developing tools, and we want to be able to use best in class and compare and contrast them in easy ways. There's going to be, in order to do that, we think things must be open source and open architecture. So that means you should be able to get to all the, all the software and all the frameworks as easy as possible. The data, however, may be yours and yours alone. So there's going to be a, a way of keeping your data private and so on. So what are we doing? So here are some principles. Knowledge base enables predictive systems biology. And what that means is, is that everything ultimately will be based on a model. And what I mean by a model, even, a, even an annotation, a simple homology annotation is a model. But we want to actually associate with that model a confidence and a probability, <laughs> more or less. And we want to be able to propagate the, the, you know, the error in, a, in, a, in an annotation all the way up to, for example, a metabolic model, in which picks growth and the like. So we have this idea that everything in the data knowledge base will be a model of some sort. It's community driven, extensible, scalable, open source. It should standardize uh, both data and the tool frameworks so that we can work together. And we're really driving towards enabling experimental design and interpretation of results. So this means it's not a database. It's a knowledge base, and I'll get to that more now. So what's the difference between a database and a knowledge base in this framework with these principles? This is a, this is a slide my team's getting sick of, but <laughs> I like. <laughs> So, so data, a database is something from which data can be extracted and displayed. And so this is, my, this is a cartoon from XKCD, which is a, a web comic that geeks like. And, uh, and more or less what they're doing here is say, you know, this is, this is uh, dangers, and this is um, uh, dangers extracted um, by the number of, of instances of the following phrase, died in a blank accident. So they're ordered by that, died in a blank accident. So at the very top of this is, of course, skydiving, which, you know, easy to die in a skydiving accident. And you go down to you know, elevator and surfing and skateboarding, and in the very, very bottom here, you end up with blogging. Two people. Now, you can probably guess what they're blogging about in this election year. <laughs> but the point is, this is extremely useful. It's the basis for everything we do. You know, everything we, everything we, we, we know, the way we work with modern society information systems is by search and ordering of search in this way. And it's, and it's, it's the basis. But, all it does is it allows the organization and search of data. The question is, is can it interpret data? And really what a knowledge base is about is it should learn a model of the data to provide um, you know, uh, conclusions or hypotheses in a sense. And, and so here, this is an example of, of, a, of a model of a book. And this should just emphasize something. So, so the question is, how good is a book? And you guys may have remembered the Netflix challenge for Suggesting a movie to you, or Audible suggests you know book you know Audible online books to you, they have models for what, for what that is, and so so in a sense, in this case, the model is um, you know a book a book's worth is is inversely proportional or inversely related anyway to the number of made up words in the book, more or less. So the idea here is that is that there's a model. Now there's only there's not just one model. There should be many models, and each model becomes is 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 scored by how well it predicts what people do. So in the Netflix case, there was people who were competing with different models for how to suggest the next movie. And the way that they scored it is whether or not people chose the movies that were suggested for them, right? So the, similarly here, the idea is you want to be able to suggest things for you to do that you can come back and tell us did it work or not, ultimately. So how are we going to do it? Well, we have to build, we have to start by, by, <laughs> by focusing. And this is not much of a focus if you think about it. So here we're focusing on, we have three science domains or advocacies within, within, the, within the program, microbes, plants, and their communities, more or less. And ultimately, we want to do exactly what was suggested during the, during the JGI business session, so to speak, which was to link these to where they live and how they live with each other and so on. And ultimately, we will do that. But in the meantime, we're going to try to crunch on the functional data that does exist and promulgate for people like JGI to create more right, of that variety. We're going to target our activities. I'm going to try to convince you that we have sort of an ordering of what needs to get done and that there's a, an ability to do this. The idea is to drive towards dynamic models of function, but we don't have to start there. 
So basically, this is for, there's sort of four categories of object. There's the inference of gene structure and annotation by homology. And largely, we're going to rely on other people to do that for us, people who use standardized frameworks to do that for us. We're going to suck that information in, and we're going to combine it with direct measurements of function direct measurements of function. And the question then is, how do, we, how do we then propagate those direct measurements across the phylogenetic tree? And so that's this next thing, which is that you take the direct measurement and guilt by association, and you do functional inference on those genes and gene features and the like. We can also do direct inference of functional networks. They can be, they can be direct measures, like protein protein interaction measure, uh, measures. They can be correlation networks. Or they can be mechanistic in some way or other. And they can be molecular networks or community networks. And so there's this inference infrastructure we're building for doing that sort of work. And ultimately, there's behavioral prediction and design. Because once you have a network, you can infer what happens when you knock out a gene, overexpress something, you know, prune a metabolic pathway, and so on. So these are our four pillars of, of models, more or less. And what, what, they're, what we're going to be doing with those is unlike a lot of systems are going to ensure that in every case we're metricizing what these, with the algorithms within these systems and the data within these systems do. We're going to have measures of confidence in the predictions and measures of quality for both the algorithm predictions and for the data itself. We're going to then, using that and using the tools that people will build to create these models and hypotheses, be able to um, become a clearinghouse for these predictions and hypotheses. And I'll try to explain to you a little, in a little bit how that's going to work. And then we also want to have this designed so we're building user communities, because you can't do this all automatically. You have to have people in the loop. And so part of our job is to get everyone here in the audience to begin to participate in this and become part of a user, a user group that uses the system and improves the models. So if you, if you think about this in terms of what exists right now, what we know is that we can take these, these four boxes, these four boxes and, and, their, and their adjutants, we can ask, what would we have to build right now to get this done? And each one of these little white boxes you see here is exi our, our existing data and algorithms that we know could operate to drive through various pieces of what, we just, what I just described and lead to models and hypotheses. So we know that we could, with sufficient time and resource, we could take what exists and build this system and make it work to some degree. So we have critical path worked out. However, we don't want to make this a single framework. We want people to be able to build new things and build new workflows and build new ways of doing things. So while this is the way, we're going to, this is the way we, we think of it, basically, it's a set of tools operating on a set of data within a common framework. And that is fundamentally what we're building. And that will allow you to open up and you can build it yourself. That means that it has to sit on some sort of common background. So to drive this, to make sure that it's scientifically useful, the advocacies within, within KBase are um, building demonstrations. I'll talk about the timeline at the end of the talk, but in February 2013, we're going to have the first production release of this object, and people are going to, and, the, and the advocacy teams are going to show up and show you how they use the framework to do certain operations. And here's an example of what microbes' overall goals are. We have microbes as, a, as one of the advocacies, is to reconstruct and predict metabolic networks, to increase the ability to communicate and utilize their data, and to enable the planning of effective experiments. That is, for example, if you wanted to discriminate between whether or not this enzyme or that enzyme was a particular hole filler in a, in a metabolic pathway, what would you have to do? So they proposed to do this by annotating genomes and assigning confidence based on the primary annotations that come from places like JGI, reconstructing metabolism and optimizing, and optimizing it for various functions that we want, reconstructing regulation and assessing agreement with things like expression data and RNA-seq data of the, that variety, integrating the standards and omics data from multiple data sources. This is where there's going to be a common data framework. People always worry about that. I think we get that fixed, or we will and uh, constructing models of microbial organisms um, and linking models with that data. How do you compare metabolic data to growth phenotype, for example? So in 13 months, what they're aiming to deliver to show what they can do is to show that data integration across many different resources that allow them to, um, to more or less get to the point where they can make regulatory and, uh, and metabolic models that are predictive of what a cell will do under given situations. So that means that a microbiologist with a genome sequence um, and growth data will be able to create a metabolic model and then show what matches and what doesn't match between the growth data and the metabolic model and have suggestions for what to do next. 
For plants, you know, they're in a different position than microbes are. We have many more complete genomes. We have a lot more data, except for an Arabidopsis, perhaps. But they really want to be able to, they would, you know, they want to be able to meet the microbial levels and surpass them because, in a lot of ways, they have to deal with the multicellularity and the and the genome diversity of their particular plant species. So they too want to make sure that you can very rapidly um, interact and uh, uh, and do data driven analyses on plants and provide the plant researchers access to all this information uh, and ultimately provide a platform for researchers to analyze their own data. So we allow you to upload your own data and your own tools and use it in that framework. So um, I, won't, I won't belabor this, but they're very interested in trying to make sure that, for example, people are talking about the same thing when they're talking about different organelles in plants or different tissues in plants and so on, different processes. And what they'll be able to do ultimately in 13 months is this sort of genotyping workflow where they'll be able to um, convert sequencing reads into genotypes and then be able to, gen be able to link those to traits in the field. So basically doing genome-wide uh, association studies. Um, although we're not going to, we're going to build, someone else is building the tools for the algorithms and we're going to bring it into in the house and let, and let you navigate it more or less. And also we'll be able to do data exploration of all the functional data that they have for model organisms like Arabidopsis so that you can um, Allow you, so you can do guilt by association models and the like. I'm going to try to leverage off the metabolic capabilities of the microbial group to build metabolic models of the plants as well. Then microbial communities, very similarly, they have um, this idea that, well, gee, first they have, they have this huge amount of data in-house, and they're going to figure out first how to move it about rapidly, which is an important piece. The second thing is they're going to do is they're going to figure out how to quality assess it so that we know what to throw out and what to keep in the analyses. And then third, they're going to figure out how to make, make their, their analyses scalable as the, data, as, as, the, as the data increases in size. Fundamentally, they want to enable the modeling of metabolic processes within the community and to predict microbial growth, both in isolation and in community size. So when, when John Eisen was asking, do we want to create artificial communities, the answer is yes. We want to predict them using tools like this. So in 13 months, I'm going to try to give you two different types of, 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 of um, uh, cuts through this information. One is they want to build a, meta, a metagenomic experiment design wizard. And that's a, that sort of tells you what technologies should you deploy to ask certain questions about a metagenomic, uh, about, about a community survey, for example. So they want to know, they, they'll enable you to, to actually perform in silico experimentation, and hypothesis assessing for how deep your sequencing should be, how many replicates you should have, what sequencing te technologies you should, you should use, and so on. Once you've done your metagenomic experiment, they want, to, uh, they, want to, they want to, of course, enable bioprospecting to find communities with similar alpha diversity, to find communities with similar biomes, to locate novel proteins, and so on. So what does KBase provide to make them do this? The first thing it provides is sort of infrastructural capabilities. And one of the things I think is most exciting about this, and one of the way, ways we're enabled by DOE, is the ability to access nimble compute. Eddie mentioned this for JGI, and it's very similar for KBase. One, we're able, to, we're able to access the ES net, which allows us to have high-speed data transfers. We're able to access fairly large-scale back-end storage systems. We have, uh, we, have access, we, we have access and have adopted the, the cloud computing resources that have been developed within the supercomputing divisions um, at, the, at the, uh, three the, three, the four national labs that are involved. Um, and we're building, uh, we're building um, a library resource for you so, so coders can use it, and a web resource so biologists can use it. And we're allowing you to do persistent data management for your own data. Most important, we're building the support for user, users, teams, and projects to crosstalk as you do your analyses. And I'll try to demonstrate that in a minute. So I just mentioned that, that we're leveraging ESNet. I think this is a very powerful thing to have, and we've, been very, we've had a very great, great, relationship, great, great relationship with them. It's going to be critical to reducing latency so you can interact with the system and get access to the compute you want effectively. We're not going to be able to scale with all the data. But we'll be able to chunk things out in reasonable ways so you can get large-scale data back and forth quickly. Similarly, the compute is sort of based on the, uh, this Oscar-originated Magellan cloud infrastructure and a, and a couple of other systems. And pretty much everything's going to be open stack, and, and you'll be able to access, we'll be able to access a lot of this compute through KBase. It will be, it'll be you know, parceled out as we need it, but it's not, it, it's, it, that's one of the things that's going to allow us to scale. And here's what the architecture roughly looks like, and it's worth thinking about this for a minute. So the idea is that we know that we're going to have large-scale computations, especially as we re-annotate and re-annotate the database. One of the things we're going to try to do 
is when something does get re-annotated as a new organism, <laughs> that we're going to be able to track that, update it, flag it, and constantly do this on an, on an, on an updated basis. And you should be able to see that version history, more or less. We're going to work on that. We're going to be able to do data intensive, uh, data intensive compute, and so that requires us to have to do MapReduce sort of operations. We need methods development for doing the Ubuntu image, and we're doing K-based application development in these K-based images. And so these are all run on what amounts to a virtual machine, so you can, you can install it and become a K-based node, if you want to look at it that way. We have this uh, cloud software stack, and then finally this commodity compute cluster hardware. So that's sort of the cloud architecture. The way that the system is put together is, at the bottom, there may be this high-end compute, but the way that things interoperate out, you know, on top of that compute is through the service-oriented architecture. And so that, that means is that we're building a unified API that you can program to, that our own programmers program to, that allow for this exchange of information in a, in a, in a fairly lightweight way. So our long-term goal really means that you will be building along with us. We can't, with our current budget, do everything that needs to get done. It has to be everybody. What's more is that even if we had the budget, we wouldn't be the right people to do it. It has to be the community driving it. There has to be a competitive edge, if you will, as people innovate within the system. That's part of our job. So this includes genomic servers, expression data servers, protein family servers, and a whole bunch of other stuff which is not shown on this, on this particular slide. The other thing we're going to try to provide is, is the fact that these services are mapped in such a way that pretty much we're pretty resilient. So that is, you can't have one node going down and then everything fails. So things are spread out among, among different locations in the United States. They are, uh, your, 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 your programming on your computer is mapped onto the multiple services at multiple locations in a seamless way, and then data is brought back to and integrated in a seamless fashion. We have these different data stores. Um, we have uh, you know, large-scale data storage and storage for, for user data over here. We have the CDM, which integrates data together for nimble compute when we need to, for that's instead of federating it from multiple sources. And we have this persistent store that allows you to store stateful information about your user sessions and things like this, because you're going to have user, user sessions. So here's what it basically looks like. You have, you have these repositories at the bottom that allow us to access data, either dynamically from the outside or from the, our internal servers. We have a unified API that deals with, inter with, with integrating services together by translating those service calls into low-level services that allow you to access the, the big compute and the user interface and graphics. On top of that, we're providing a, a, a sort of an application stack that allows you to do functional inference of geno in, in genomes, metabolic and regulatory networks and community networks, model-based engineering, and comparative analysis of these particular networks. Then up here, we figure there's going to be some of these end user interfaces that allow us to do various things. And over here is where other people can plug into our system directly. So um, an example is, is that the people who have developed this, or who are developing this tool, are working scientists uh, who are actually asking biological questions. And they were motivated in their own research to build large data systems. And so these are example, the examples on the bottom here are, are, are tools that our own team were involved in developing, which include microbes online, seed, RAST, MGRAST, uh, and the like. And so these are all things we've known how to do. Now what we want to do is we want to make, make interoperation with those frameworks seamless, move what needs to get moved into central store to make it nimble, and then be able to shove that up into, into the K-based layer. The K-based services themselves are going to, really the idea here is to integrate these core services and enable K, uh, this, this unified interface. The reason why we're doing this is so that you can plug in as well. It's not a strongly linked system. It allows you to plug in your own algorithms in various ways. Think of it like better than Photoshop plugins, if you will. And you need to have a uniform view of K-based core services and an internal standard for data interchange. So the idea is, is that while we're going to be very compliant with GSC standards and the like, internally, we will also have a standard that will allow you to move data around rapidly and, 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 and cleanly, and a, and a standard set of graphical interfaces. Most importantly is building the user experience. And we're still sort of discussing how to do this, how to make it as useful as possible to the broadest constituency as possible. And um, the idea here is that while we can provide all these beautiful hardcore services for doing these very sophisticated biological operations. How do you get biologists to work with such sophisticated systems when they're not familiar with all the modeling technologies or all the data analysis tools and so on? And one of the things we're struggling with is how to do that right. And whereas at the same time, not hiding all the complexity from those who are, who are aficionados. So ultimately, there'll be um, these two ways of working with the K-based developer community, and I'll talk about the rest of everybody. 
One is to work within KBase, and you can do that by extending from below, by adding additional core services and extending the KBase API. And the other is by plugging applications that use the API. By the way, you can, the idea is that you'd be able to use API, uh, KBase widgets on your own sites and within your own software. And so there'd be sort of a powered by KBase logo where if you integrate stuff from, you, from, from us into you, then you can, you can show that that's the case. So here's the, here's the goals for the user experience. You'll be able to keep rate with data generation, be able to integrate data, different data types, develop analytical tools, do rapid comparisons, grow, uh, and, and so on. So this is a, this is a concept car. One of the things we're thinking of, we're, we're, we're designing for development within KBase, and it shows you how a biologist might work with the system. The central new object here from the biology user experience is what we're calling a narrative. You log on to the system, you're interested in, for example, the functional annotation of a particular genome. You want to drive it all the way to a set of models, and you're going to do that in a narrative. And in the narrative, you'd start off by saying, I'm interested in bacteroides, la la la. And then you'd begin to write in this, on this web page or on this application a series of text and commands that allow you to talk about what you're doing in an almost English language interface. Those of you who use Mathematica, think sort of in, those, in, that, in, that, in that framework. When you log in, you get, this, you get three panels. This panel over here would have you know, all this information about you. I have these 12 narratives. I have, um, I have two, I've uploaded two genomes. I'm in the middle of, you know, I, have, I have a model I've been, I've been working on and so on. You can create new narratives. You can create a new team. You can manage your teams. You can manage your narratives. And you can add data to the system. Over here is a, is a, is a panel that allows you to, to go to the search, subset data, bring it to this panel, and add it to your data tab. And then you have these functions that allow you to pull functions from the database in a graphical way. And then here's your narrative. Now the point of this narrative is that you know, you're adding data sets, you're analyzing them, you're annotating them themselves, you can clip in data at different locations. And very importantly, there's these four buttons up top. One of them is publish. So if you think that you've done enough and you want to show people, you can publish the document. And this can be published to your team, it can be published to a person, or it can be published to the world. And we think that if this gets good enough, you could just publish to a, to a specialized journal in this type of narrative. You have script. So once you've built this thing, of course, what you have is a series of data settings, data subsettings, and a series of commands that operate on it with some user interaction in the middle. But you can still imagine that you could push this button and a script would be made, and you could run it on the command line without all this graphical stuff in the way. And then you could edit it for your own work. And then these two buttons are kind of interesting. It could be if, you, if you've done a bunch of modeling and you, now you have a hypothesis, you can mark it as a hypothesis. And someone else can come in and mark it with experimental data. So I want to talk about what this could lead to. Imagine you're some person, you're working on, on a narrative, and you've decided that there's a branch point, and maybe you have two different hypotheses. You're going to follow each one up in a branch, branch of that narrative. And this one has two, two branches and so on. So this is an idea of a versioning system. You're making more and more hypotheses, but they're branching hypotheses. And each branch has a, different hypo has a different hypothesis in it or different experimental data. It could be you get to the end of one of these and it validates a hypothesis in your own narrative. And you may have multiple narratives you're working on simultaneously. Now, someone else can come in and, for example, have a narrative in which they generate an experimental an the analysis of experimental data that is confirmatory of your hypothesis and they link to it. And there it is. Similarly, down here, you may be able to use the same basic narrative flow to evaluate a, a, uh, evalu uh, evaluate a different hypothesis with different data, or you can link to a different, uh, a different narrative which is related to your own, or over here, you can rerun your narrative on new data in the database. So you can imagine this social interface here. This is actually a graph of what you're working on, who's talking about your work, and what other work is, is related to your own. Now you can imagine being able to navigate that social graph. And so imagine that you're interested in bacteroides and you search for bacteroides and you can find all the narratives that are about bacteroides and who's talking about them and how often they're accessed and so on. So we're thinking that'd be a way of trying to develop a user community around how this thing fun around different topics in biology. So how are we going to build that community sort of socially and otherwise? First thing to recognize is that the K-based team is actually four national labs and, uh, and, a, and a scattering of universities and institutes. Um, it's, I think it's a fantastic team. They've just come together really well. They've really dedicated themselves. They've spent weeks traveling and getting together and hacking around, and it's been really cool. Um, but we are, we're the core developers, if you think, of the kernel of this object. There's an org chart, but I'm not going to belabor it. 
other than to say that there are people you can talk to, who I'll cite in a moment, who will link you into this if you want. And you should, you should definitely come to our workshops when we have them. We had one here, our second one. And I want to emphasize that we are nucleators. Think of us as the kernel developers. We want to allow effective and easy federation centralization of data, lower the bar to accessing new algorithms, but it's your data and your tools that we want to see integrated into this framework. And we want to see you drawing tools and data from KBase into your tools and your analyses and your sites. That community is what we want to build. And really, this is being built because we want to enable our own research and yours. We see that there's four types of KBase users, and I think this is very important. We call them A, B, C, and D. One is professional computational biologists, people who don't want to see any of the graphical stuff, don't want to see the narrative interface, don't want to see any of that stuff. They just want a script. So we've been providing language generators that generate, you know, that, that give you the access to the libraries in various languages that allow you to program the way you want to program. We think there's going to be data generators and basic analysts. These are people who are generating their own data, have their own data systems, but want to use resources that KBase provides to compare their data to everyone else's and to use tools that they don't have in-house, but then they want to reserve it in their own format. So we want to provide them widgets and things like that that they can put on their page that access all those things and let them do their job. We think there are going to be knowledge seekers, people who don't want to do any, any, any modeling, just want to see what other people have done or what data is in the database, and then they can access this as like a database, and then knowledge generators who can actually use that sort of narrative interface to communicate to the community what they think is going on about a given gene, a given organism, a given pathway, whatever they wish. So we hope to be able to engage with you by really making this unique resource, number one. Number two, give, you know, giving workshops, and maybe next year, you know, do you, we, the, the JGI and the KBase will get together and do something together on that to see if what we, what we can do in that area. We want to hear from you because one of the big mistakes that large infrastructures like this tend to make is not to listen to the people they're trying to serve. And I think JGI has made a great model of how to do that with their users. I think we want to do the same thing here. So the more you can talk to us, the more you can tell us what you need and what you want or what you, what you can do for you, that better. So you can visit us at uh, kbase.science.energy.gov. And if you want to contact us generically, it's outreach at kbase.us. And very useful. So when will we do it? Um, I think the important dates here are that in August of 2012, we'll make the first um, public, data pub public uh, beta release. So you could download it and work with it on your own machine. And in February 2013, we'll have the first K-based production release. That's fundamentally what you need to know. You can always check for updates at the K-based website. Um, with that, I just want to thank you. I want to tell you the people involved now. Um, I'm the CEO and CSO. Uh, Rick Stevens is uh, my very powerful uh, and dynamic CTO. He's working with Tom Breton, who's making the infrastructure team really work, making that common infrastructure that, we, that you'll access be a really functional object that doesn't get in your way. Parnford de Hall and Chris Henry are running the microbes uh, section. Uh, Fulker Meyer and Dylan Shivian communities, Doreen Ware and David Weston are running plants. So these are the people who you can uh, run down and contact in these various areas. You can always talk to Bob Cottingham, who's our chief operations officer. He'll, he'll hook you up to the right people and make sure you're in the right place. Uh, and you can always you know, talk to me. So with that, that's it. Thanks a lot. No questions for Adam? I had a question in relation to how does this really, <clears throat> how is this similar or dissimilar from Galaxy, the program? So, so, yeah, so Galaxy is a workflow tool, right, that, that allows you to link different, you know, tools together in sort of a pipeline. This is a much more, one is a much more, um, it's a much less linear set of tools that you can use simultaneously. Um, and, and second, it's, it, it's, dedicated, it's dedicated to a different type of analysis than Galaxy is really is really designed for, which is sort of pipeline analyses that work best in that framework. Now, we don't have any, we, we, we believe that a number of our things will plug into Galaxy and, and it will be a great system for interoperating with KBase. But it's not, it, it's driving towards a different set of goals, I think, than Galaxy is. Adam, if, Adam? Yeah. If people are, if people are interested in becoming beta testers, um, should they contact you? How, what, will, what will be the yeah. process for that? So, so you know, in, as we, so we're, just, just to make it clear, we're, we're, about, we're about 
uh, eight months into the project, <laughs> or maybe a little bit less than that. And we initially, we want to generate a set of very, uh, very high value collaborations where we're making sure that we have a tight integration with those people, and, and that's what we need right now. In, uh, as, we meet, as we move into the May and August framework, then, then we want to expand a little bit. And definitely talk to me, talk to Bob, talk to the, to the different heads uh, that I mentioned, you know, Paramvir and, and Folker and Doreen. And, and we can start getting involved. And then when August rolls around, you'll be able to load it onto your own machine and begin to bug us <laughs> about, about how they're working. And once, once we find common ground to do something, let's work together. Yeah, uh, the second question. Um, will this program allow integration of uh, genetic information from like said, an Amazon bucket that's sequenced off-site, say at Complete Genomics or something of that nature, integrated um, into it? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So there's a, there's a, there'll be an API that, that, you know, for, 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 for data access and, da and, and data management. And so I, I don't see any reason why not, as long as you wrote the wrapper to that information into, into Kbase. Now, if it turns out that an Amazon bucket is where everyone's storing things, then, of course, we'll try to, we'll try to harden that interface and make it a key piece. But what we imagine is going to happen, if you look at those resources we had at the bottom, you know, model, you know, Microsoft Online and Model Seed and things like that, those teams are, are just making interface wrappers that allow Kbase to link in and, and use their services and use their data. So I would assume it would be the same thing with that. I think in the interest of time, we'll probably move on. Thank you.